Okay, it's time to move on to a different application. And again, we're going to use the same mathematical framework that we've already built. But we're going to do different physics. Okay, it's so the beauty of this uh, course. We're focusing on what is the mathematics? What's the mathematics that can be applied uh, with most generality to lots of different areas of physics? And um, the framework I present is very versatile, as I uh, advertised at the beginning of the course. Here is another physical system that you might have seen again in high school physics. But we're going to reappraise it using our framework. And what you can see there is two, three, three masses, okay, just sitting on a table. Imagine they're sitting on a table. So I want you to forget about gravity for now. Well, gravity will come in a little bit. So we're just looking down at three masses on a table frictionless table for now let's just assume okay and they're connected by springs springs a and b and what you're looking at is both an equilibrium configuration and then what i call a displaced configuration and what i mean by that is that i've moved the three masses from their equilibrium positions x1 x2 x3 imagine they're all sitting on a line and we're measuring the distance along the line in the x direction okay and so x1 x2 x3 are the equilibrium positions of these masses and then they get displaced you just move them okay you push them and put them into these new positions x1 hat x2 hat x3 hat and of course what happens is that the springs develop tensions in them because they're getting basically pulled or compressed depending on the displacements. Okay, and when I say displacements, what I mean is I define the important quantity to be the displacement of mass i. Okay, so it would basically be xi hat minus xi and that will be phi i. Okay, so this is, this is the displacement. OK, so it's the it's the distance by which uh, mass I has been removed from its uh, equilibrium position. OK, now. Under the assumption that the spring is a linear spring, and that's an assumption, then it turns out that um, someone called Robert Hooke told us what a good model for the tension that develops in such a spring is. This is what we call Hooke's law. OK. Hooke's law says that the tension, let's look at spring A, the tension that you can see there with the arrows drawn, so it's the thing that's pulling the, uh, pulling the masses together, is given by Ca, which is a spring constant. Now remember, when I was talking about circuits, Ca was a conductance, but now it's a spring constant. It's a completely different object, but it's kind of a, a material parameter associated with the spring for edge, because you can see what I'm going to do later. The masses will be nodes and the springs will be edges in a kind of graph theoretic formulation of this problem. And then Hooke said that the tension is phi 2, the displacement of mass 2, which is connected to one side of uh, spring A, minus phi 1. OK, so there it is. Beautiful result. It's Hooke's law for a linear spring between nodes 2 and 1. Um, with spring constant Ca. Okay, so that's the fundamental law that's going to replace Ohm's law in the electric circuit theory. We're in a completely different physical context though. Let me get rid of what I just drew and let me get rid of uh, this. And let's look at this in a specific situation. So you can see where I want to go with this. I, I want to introduce a graph. And so what I'm going to do, look, is I'm going to label the nodes. So the node, uh, sorry, the node labels, the node labels are one, two, and three. And we've got edges A and B. Okay, so let's form our incidence matrix. And remember what you do with this is you put the the um, columns are labeled by the nodes and then for each edge you've got a you've got a row. OK, and um, what I'm going to do here, look, is let me put the very natural uh, directions on here. Just like that. So this is one, two and three. So here are my arrows. OK. 
uh, and one, two, and three are my masses. And you can see, look, that my incidence matrix will be, it comes out edge A, look, this is A and B. Edge A comes out of one and into two, doesn't touch three. Um, edge B doesn't touch one, but comes out of two and into three. Okay, so there's my incidence matrix for this simple graph, uh, graph of uh, three masses and two springs connecting them. Okay, so let's let x be the vector of displacements. Okay, I just define the displacements of node x. So in this case, x will be phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. Okay, so let's compute ax. Well, I think you can see, right, that uh, let's just write it out because we're doing this for the first time. So we've got this. This will be phi 2 minus phi 1, phi 3 minus phi 2. Okay? Now, you remember Ohm, uh, Hooke's law, Hook. He told us that uh, the tension in edge A is uh, phi 2 minus phi 1, and tension B will be analogously phi 3 minus phi 2. Okay, where CB will be the spring constant associated with spring B. Now you can see, look, if I define the vector T to be TA, TB, can you not see, look, that this is basically CA, phi 2 minus phi 1, CB, phi 3 minus phi 2, and I think we've got enough experience now to, to know that this can be written as C, well, let's write it like this, CA, CB, diagonal matrix, and then uh, we're going to write this, of course, as AX. So in other words, this is CAX, where this is this uh, matrix. Okay? Very interesting. Okay? So, let's just rewrite that again. We've decided that the vector of tensions is C A X. That's from Hook. Now you remember when we were doing circuits, this was a vector of currents, not T. It was called W there. I'm calling it T now because it's more natural for tensions. Um, and you remember we considered the quantity minus A transpose W there, but now I'm going to consider this quantity. It's the divergence of the tensions at the nodes, okay, by definition. All right, so let's just see what that is. Well, if you just, I'm just going to write down my, um, this is the, I'm just looking it up there. This was the, I need a minus sign. This is the A transpose there, and this is TB, okay. And let's just work that out. Let me put the minus sign through before I do it, look. And I think you can see, can't you, that this quantity here is TA. It's TB minus TA, and it's minus TB. Okay, so minus A transpose T, I've just decided for the graph that you can see above is that. Now, how would you describe the vector, the three-dimensional vector I've just written down? If you look at the uh, diagram, aren't those three elements basically the net forces on the masses due to the springs? Looking at node, look at node one, mass one. The only surf, um, spring force on it is plus T A from from spring A. If you look at uh, mass 2, it's got a minus TA force on it from spring A and a plus TB force on it from spring B. And then finally, of course, uh, mass 3 has a minus TB on it. So this is the total spring forces on the masses. Okay, so the, the, the forces, the internal forces, I like to call them internal forces because it's kind of like the, the internal spring forces uh, on the masses. Okay, we have now got Hooke's law, 
we have now got a, an interpretation of what minus ATT stands for, the divergence of the tensions. We need to replace KCL. What's KCL here? Okay, well, here it is. If we're in equilibrium, it's not Kirchhoff anymore, it's actually Newton. Ohm has been replaced by Hooke, and Kirchhoff has been replaced by Newton. And at the moment, we're going to assume that everything's in equilibrium. OK, and what Newton said is that if something's sitting in equilibrium, then there can be no net force on it. OK, so let's let little f now be the total external forces on the masses. OK, so it would be F1, F2, F3. What do I mean by external forces? I mean the ones that don't come from the springs. So, for example, I, I said well, I ignored gravity earlier, but suppose, nevertheless, this was in a gravitational field, then there would be external forces due to the gravity on there. Um, these could be attached to walls or something, and then there'll be reaction forces from the walls. Um, all kinds of other external forces are going to be allowed by introducing this vector f. And you know what? I'm going to call this vector fi because I like to think of it as the internal forces due to the springs. Okay, let me just make myself uh, some more room. So equilibrium means f plus fi must be equal to zero. The total forces must be zero according to Newton. Okay, but this means that F is equal to minus Fi. But minus Fi is minus minus A transpose T from here. Let me just do that in pink so you can see where I got that from. Well, what's T? Put that together, the minus signs cancel out, and I can put CAX there, and lo and behold, look at that. I am seeing the weighted Laplacian again for this particular graph. Um, and uh, in this case, it's being weighted by the spring constants in this matrix C, um, but now look what's happening. The, the structure of the equation is exactly the same, except we have a different interpretation of everything. Uh, now it should be borne in mind that x is now my vector of displacements of each mass, and f is the external forces on each mass. And what this equation says is that the, the vector of external forces is equal to the the weighted Laplacian times the vector of displacements. So the structure is exactly the same. It's just that the physical interpretation of the objects X and F is different. OK, um, and the, the weighted Laplacian now is not weighted with conductances, but instead spring constants.